Welcome to our second presentation covering disability discrimination. I'm going to advance to the slide that we are on. We left around slide 63, so let me take, me, take us to that spot. Here we go. So um, in our first lecture, we had kind of an overview of disability law, disability discrimination law in the employment context. And then we talked about the prima facie case and how it's similar to and different from the Title VII model. And then we went through some key ADA concepts, things like disability, the term major life activity, the term qualification or otherwise qualified is another way that we see this term, essential functions, direct threat, reasonable accommodation, and do hardship. We're going to drill down into more detail, especially with these last two concepts in our next section, which we're calling the reasonable accommodation process. And then we're going to talk about a few special categories of disabilities and how the law addresses those situations. Then we'll segue to uh, remedies. What can a successful plaintiff expect to get in a lawsuit alleging disability employment discrimination? And then we'll talk about a few special topics, concerns that you may want to have when we're talking about hiring, the possibility of disability harassment, uh, contingent workers, the topic of retaliation and workers' compensation, how genetics information can uh, fit into the disability discrimination uh, paradigm, and also leave issues. Um, so just wanted to kind of get us started on these topics and so we're going to start on the reasonable accommodation process but before we begin I'd like to do just a bit of an it of a reinforcement of some terms that we've already talked about if it's been a little while since you've uh, watched the um, uh, presentation uh, for lecture number one I think it's helpful to kind of uh, be refreshed a little bit so I thought we'd get out the statute and look at some of these terms we can see here that we have our three-pronged definition of disability and we can see that we have the first definition which is by far the most important which is a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits um, one or more major life activities of an individual our second and third categories are less important, but they still are in the statute and they definitely can come up. Uh, the, the second is a record of having such a, an impairment, the, the type of impairments that's described up here. So maybe this person had it in the past or being regarded as having such an impairment. Another term that we talked about was major life activities. And you can see here a definition. Major life activities include, but are not limited to, caring for oneself, performing manual tasks, seeing, hearing, eating, sleeping, walking, standing, lifting, bending, speaking, breathing, learning, reading, concentrating, thinking, commu communicating, and working. Kind of a, again, it's not just one particular job, but generally not being able to work. Then another category that we have is called major bodily functions. And here's our definition for that. A major bodily function includes the operation of a major bodily function, including, but not limited to, functions of the immune system, normal cell uh, growth, digestive, bowel, bladder, neurological, brain, respiratory, circulatory, endocrine, and reproductive functions. All those can be considered a major life activity that if there is a mental or physical impairment that substantially limits it, that then that person has a disability. And we can see here that we have a little bit more granularity about our uh, category C under the disability, our third prong, being regarded as having such an impairment. And we see here a little bit more of a definition here. An individual meets the requirements of being regarded as having such an impairment if the individual establishes that he or she has been subjected to an action prohibited under this chapter because of an actual or perceived physical or mental impairment whether or not the impairment limits or is perceived to limit a major life activity. So you can see how this can open up this, uh, or the idea of disability to even more um, situations. Um, and so, um, the, as we talked before, that these are intended to be interpreted broadly. And you can see here the term substantially limits shall be, in, shall be interpreted consistently with the findings and purposes of those amendments in 2008. So they should be interpreted um, in a way to include more than to exclude. Then we see the information about um, mitigating uh, uh, circumstances, things like taking insulin if you're a diabetic and how we're not going to consider those uh, uh, mitigating circumstances. The one exception is going to be ordinary glasses and contacts. I wanted to refresh on these definitions because 
They are important. Here's our definition for direct threat. Direct threat means a significant risk of harm, risk to the health or safety of others that cannot be eliminated by reasonable accommodation. You may recall that we had a case in which this was actually defined for others to include the employee himself. And then here, of course, we have our definition of the employer, which includes anyone that has more than 15, 15 or more employees. And we'll talk more about the illegal use of drug in a little bit. Here's our definition of a qualified person. Let's just refresh on this one for a second. The qualified individual means a person who, with or without reasonable accommodation, can perform the essential functions of the employment position that such an individual holds or desires. For the purpose of this subsection, consideration shall be given to the employer's judgment as to what functions of a job are essential. And if the employer has prepared a written description before advertising or interviewing, this is important, before advertising or interviewing applicants for the job, that description shall be considered evidence of the essential functions of the job. I'm going to skip ahead or skip over reasonable accommodation and do hardship and save that for last. Here's a general dis uh, description of discrimination. No covered entity, this means employer, shall discriminate against a qualified individual on the basis of disability in regard to job application procedures, the hiring, advancement, or discharge of employees, employment compensation, job training, and other terms, conditions, and privileges of employment. Here is information about um, medical examinations and inquiries, when we can do them, um, and we'll talk more about pre-employment and also when there is a construct or a, 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 a pending job offer. Okay, so we're going to go back and now look at reasonable accommodation and undue hardship. Here we go. So reasonable accommodation, the term reasonable accommodation may include making existing facilities used by employees readily accessible to and usable by individuals with disabilities. So this suggests that there may need to be some architectural changes or people's workstations may need to be moved. There may need to be actual footprint changes in the facility or it can be um, simpler things like, I don't know, let's say in the uh, in the break room, everybody's been keeping the, the sweetener and the creamer up in the high shelf where the person who is in a wheelchair isn't able to reach that. So it may just be as simple as moving the creamer and the sugar down to a lower cabinet. Um, so very simple things can be necessary for a reasonable accommodation. So that's the first prong. Let's look at the second prong. The term reasonable accommodation may include job restructuring, part-time or modified work schedules, reassignment of a vacant position, acquisition or modification of equipment or devices. This is a really common one. Appropriate adjustment or modifications of examinations, training materials or policies. The provision of qualified readers. This would be useful if somebody is a vision, has low vision or perhaps has a, a learning difference that makes it difficult for them to read. Or interpreters. This could be somebody who is deaf or hard of hearing and other similar accommodations for individuals with disabilities. So this is what's involved in the reasonable accommodation part. And of course, we have to reasonably accommodate it for an employer up to the point it becomes an undue hardship. So what do we mean by undue hardship? Well, here we go. The term undue hardship means an action requiring significant difficulty or expense when consider the light factors considered in the next section. So what are the factors to be considered? Let's con um, look at them for a second. Factors to be considered. In determining whether an, an accommodation shall impose an undue hardship on a covered entity, factors to be considered include the nature and cost of the accommodation needed under this chapter. So how much does it cost to buy that special uh, software or, or whatever? The overall financial resources of the facility or facilities involved in the provision of the reasonable accommodation, the number of persons employed at such facility, the effect on expenses and resources, or the impact otherwise of such accommodation upon the operation of the facility. The overall financial resources of the covered entity, so this is beyond just the individual facility, maybe this is a, a business that has several different locations. The overall size of the business of a covered entity with respect to the number of employees, the number, type, and location of facilities, and the type of operation or operations of the covered facility, including the composition, structure, and function of the workforce of such entity, the geographical separateness, administrative, or fiscal relationship of the facility or facilities in question to the covered entity. 
So you can see this is a pretty open-ended situation. There's not a lot of guidance about when too much or when, it, when um, something becomes too much or unnecessary. So you really have to dive into the case law to just know where that line is. And actually these cases are very fact specific. If you work for a large employer, just understand that there's almost, there's gonna be very few times where money is going to be a cause for being able to argue for undue hardship. Um, there, there may be other reasons beyond money, but money is not usually going to be a winning argument. If you're working for a much smaller employer, it becomes more possible to advance that argument. And yet, if we're talking a few thousand dollars, uh, probably not. Certainly not in the category of a few hundred dollars. And so um, this is useful to think about or be aware of, but just recognize that this is very abstract and you have to really dive into the details to know where the lines are. Anyway, I wanted to show you the statute in part because there's so many specific terms in, in this that, that you have to really kind of get a good grasp of. And also to kind of show you what legal professionals do with these types of documents. Um, I've been hopefully successfully been explaining to y'all um, what you need to do with the stat with the statute or with the the cases uh, but it's also useful for you to experience what it's like to actually deal with the source documents so i thought that would be a useful exercise for us to go through let's now return though to our powerpoint here we go okay so we're going to talk about how that reasonable accommodation process should occur. We've talked about what might qualify as a reasonable accommodation, but we haven't talked about what that process looks like. So let's do that. The EOC has guidance in this area. Actually, and I should just open this up, but let's go back, go to the guidance for a second just so we can see what that looks like. Um, here we go. This is that website that I have a link here and you can see they provide a lot of information here. Um, we don't need a lot of information to avoid discriminating against people because of their gender or their race or national origin. I mean there's no heavy lifting there. Just don't. I mean that's kind of the advice you need. Just stop being a jerk basically. But when we get into disability it becomes a lot more complicated because guess what? I don't know what somebody who has a brain injury might need in the workforce. Um, I can give you an example of a situation that I dealt with when I was in private practice. There was an individual who um, uh, had uh, advanced degrees, who had a lot of uh, historical, sophisticated knowledge about lots of different uh, statistical uh, approaches to things and was obviously at one point a very, very smart person. Anyway, he had um, a brain aneurysm and um, a, a few years earlier and uh, he came to work for uh, my, my client and he uh, presented his disability as um, having a limited vision as a result of his aneurysm and he needed a, a variety of accommodations to help him uh, see things on computer screens, see, read things and things like that. And we were happy and able to get him that. But it became obvious to his coworkers that in addition to the vision impairment, that he had an intellectual impairment as a result of the aneurysm. It wasn't his fault. He, you know, he, he just, this is what happened to him as a result of this particular situation. The people with whom he was working hadn't known him before the aneurysm, but uh, it seemed pretty clear that somebody with his limitations would not have been able to achieve the things that he had obviously achieved in his life. He was not um, aware or willing to admit that there were these intellectual limitations. Uh, there were some indications in his private life that maybe um, he had some of these limitations. For example, his wife would only give him enough money for lunch. Um, and so he would come to work and he would have like $7 until he could go to the cafeteria and buy lunch. But he couldn't, he wouldn't have enough money to buy gas or do anything else. And so it, it seemed possible that the wife really understood that he had some significant limitations. Um, well, how do you address an issue like this? This person who is obviously uh, struggling with his performance, but we just don't know what's going on here. So when you are confronted with issues like that, you, you, you don't know 
what technologies are out there or what other people have done. And so what you want to do is find out. And one way of doing this is to go to the EOC website and look at some suggestions. So here's some ideas that have happened, you know, oh, well, maybe we should job restructure. Maybe we should consider a leave of absence. Um, maybe we should consider modified or part-time work schedules. Maybe we should consider reassigning the worker. Um, and you can see there's lots of other um, ideas here that can be in play. An even better resource, though, is the JAN, Job Accommodation Network. And here you can type in a particular illness. I have no idea what this is. I don't even know how to pronounce it. But that's obviously a medical condition, and you can learn about it, and you can learn about how you accommodate somebody with this. Um, issues that might come up with this. Um, let's say you have someone who has um, a latex allergy. You click on this and find out, well, what are the ways of addressing a latex allergy? Perhaps in the medical field, um, what are some, some things that can be done under those circumstances? Um, and so uh, as you go through these events, you'll see, let me just uh, pull up one just to show you. that they oftentimes will list particular brands and let me just go and, and pull up maybe another one here that we might have. Um, let's do low vision. So here's some examples of things that have been been used in other circumstances. Here's some accommodation ideas for people with uh, low vision. So you might have accessible mobile phones, accessible telephones, apps for individuals with low vision, enlarged keyboard tops and labels, magnification, a hand magnifier, again, very inexpensive, but could be all that you need. See all kinds of ideas that you might not have thought about. A talking scale, a talking money identifier, a talking copier, a co talking color detector. So all kinds of things that you can uh, consider doing. And when you click on these, a talking alarm clock, it'll uh, suggest um, various brands that might be appropriate for this particular uh, condition. So you can see it gets very specific where you can buy them and what the brands are that might be appropriate for this particular uh, situation. So very hands-on, very specific guidance. And so that's one of the, the benefits to both the EOC and to the JAN. But before we even get started with you know, picking and choosing what kind of tool we're going to buy or how we're going to adapt the workplace, the first thing we need to know is that there is a need. Um, and how do we find that out? Well, sometimes it becomes obvious. I mean, if somebody shows up to your working environment in a wheelchair, you know, it's not difficult to know that there might be a problem of accessibility, either in terms of getting around the facility or in terms of doing the job. But there may be more subtle conditions where it's not obvious that the person needs some assistance. And so who bears the burden? Well, of course, the employee bears the burden. He or she needs to come forward and say, I am I am not able to do it in the I need I need some special thing to help me do this job um, it may again it may be something that doesn't it could be free just reorganizing a workspace or it could be something that does involve some kind of technological or other approach but the employee has to come forward uh, first of all to let the employer know that there is a disability and number two that an accommodation is needed but the employee isn't required to use any kind of magic terms. He doesn't have to say the word disability. He doesn't have to say the word accommodation. He doesn't have to say the Americans with Disabilities Act. He just needs to, in probably layperson's terms, say, hey, uh, you know, I have ADHD and I need blank. And so it, it falls upon the employer to figure out, ah, Americans with Disabilities Act, disability, reasonable accommodation. The employee doesn't have to go to a particular person. He, you know, you can't make the employee say, okay, well, anytime you have a reasonable accommodation request, you have to go to Bob, who is, you know, four floors down and three hallways over. 
most likely the employee is going to go to a supervisor and that supervisor may not be an HR person, may not have a lot more sophisticated understanding of this area than the employee. So it's incumbent upon the organization to drill that information down. That supervisor might, uh, you know, if, if he or she is untrained might say, we can't do that. No, you suck it up. Just do your job and not realize, oh yes, the employer has obligations in this area. So once the employee brings that problem to the attention of the employer, then the interactive process starts. And you can see by this terminology that it's a back and forth. The employee usually starts the conversation, although not always. And then the employer, okay, well, tell me more. Describe uh, what's going on here that, uh, and, and what type of interactions or, or might be appropriate. And then you're going to explore lots of things. You're going to maybe look on the JANs. You're going to maybe um, do some independent research. You're going to find out from the employee what the employee thinks. You may be reviewing information from a doctor or a physical therapist or something like that. You may try some things. Oh, that doesn't work. Oh, but that does work. But well, that solves part of the problem, but doesn't solve all the problem. And so this is going to be a rather, sometimes, if, I mean, sometimes it's a five minute conversation problem solve and move on, but sometimes it can be a rather long process, a trial and error, trying this fix, trying that fix, uh, putting this fix on top of that fix. And so it's going to be a lengthy conversation in many cases, and it may be multiple conversations. It's important in this situation for the employer to be positive, open, receptive, cooperative, and acting in good faith. There ought to be that willingness to problem solve, to brainstorm, to think through those issues. That becomes an important part of the evidence. So how is that interaction going to work? Well, one thing you want to do is just meet with the, the worker and ideally meet with the worker uh, very soon after the request is made. Uh, depending upon the circumstances, it's likely to be appropriate that you meet confidentially in a you know, room with a door. You want to get as much information as possible about the condition without going into personal facts that aren't relevant. You know, for example, how the employee got this condition is probably not relevant. Uh, it may not be relevant how the employee deals with the condition outside of work, although uh, techniques that the employee uses outside of work may be transferable into work. And so it's not necessarily the case um, that those could transfer. So it's important to be sensitive and to respect privacy, but it also is important to get some, some information because this person has been dealing with this issue, perhaps for his or her entire life. And so they have a lot of expertise, a lot of knowledge, a lot of trial and error. And then you want to explore alternatives. And I think it's good to start this process with just a, look, we're not making any promises. We're just going to throw stuff out here. And some of the things we talk about aren't going to work. And we're not saying we're even prepared to try them, but let's talk through it. If you start saying, oh, well, we're not spending more than $1,000 and cutting off that discussion, then ideas that are under $1,000 may never get raised because you weren't willing to talk about the totality of the concepts. You also want to document the process. I, you know, you don't want to uh, let the documentation interfere with that brainstorming process, but it is a good idea for the HR professional or the supervisor of the employee to take some notes after the meeting to talk about some ideas that were uh, discussed and some that maybe are going to be pursued more, some that were rejected for whatever reason. Uh, this is especially important if the relationship seems to be contentious. So you want to show that you're acting in good faith. So it's good to say, you know, the, the steps that you're taking. It's also good to hold each other accountable. Um, if the HR person says, well, okay, I'm going to research uh, technologies in this area, I'll get back to you in three days. You know, have a deadline so that, you know, we all kind of know what the timeline for these types of tasks are. And it's a good idea for, you know, the supervisor to reach out to that HR person or to have the HR person reach out to the supervisor and make sure that the, the deadlines and expectations are being honored. The employer does have the right for medical documentation that the condition does exist and the condition does have these particular limitations. Um, obviously, this is not a blank check. The employer doesn't need to know everything about the medical situation. Also, the employer needs to keep this information very, very confidential. This information does not belong in the employee's personnel file. It should be available only on a need-to-know basis, and the people who need to know is a very, very small universe. 
probably someone from HR, probably the supervisor. If various people have to approve budgets, it could be some additional folks. If there's a doctor or a nurse as kind of a medical person and, and the staff of this particular facility, perhaps that person as well. But it shouldn't be an, an infinite list of people who have need to know about this. Now, obviously, if a person is in a circumstance where there may be some uh, crises in this person's health situation, then there may need to be additional people who need to have some training in order to handle any kind of medical emergencies that arise. But outside of that circumstance, not too many people need to know about this. Um, while we, we've talked about reasonable accommodation primarily from the standpoint of how disruptive it is for the work environment, how expensive it is, one thing that the employer doesn't have to do, even if it's not expensive, is the employer does not have to violate the seniority rights of other employees. Now, let's be clear here. The employer can violate the security, uh, seniority rights of other employees, um, assuming that there is no collective bargaining agreement that the, that the employer would be violating under those circumstances. Uh, so it's not that the employer can't do that, but the employer is not required to do that. So uh, most of the most of our employers in this particular market are not going to be unionized. There's not going to be a collective bargaining agreement in play. So just because that they don't have to doesn't mean they can't. An employer never has to reassign essential functions of a job. We talked about what an essential function was in our first lecture, but just a little refresher. Um, it's why the job exists. It's the main reason for the job. And so if I'm a receptionist and my job is to greet customer, greet uh, clients who are coming in, well, to reassign the function of greeting clients to someone else means I don't really have a job. I mean, why do you need a receptionist who isn't greeting people? What, what's that about? Um, and so you don't have to reassign um, essential functions, but you do sometimes have to reassign non-essential functions. So again, if I am the uh, relief uh, secretary um, Tuesday afternoons for three hours when the main secretary um, is doing some other task, that isn't why this particular company has a receptionist. They don't have it for the purpose of the receptionist being the relief secretary. So that would be a non-essential function. So if I, because of my a disability, am not able to do that non-essential function, then the employer can reassign that non-essential function to someone else. Also, the employer could reasonably accommodate that. Let's say that in order for me to function as a secretary for those three hours, uh, um, I, the employee, would need a, a larger keyboard and a larger screen. Well, if that's all I need and the employer was willing to get those for me so I could perform those non-essential functions, that would be fine for the employer to make those changes, but the employer wouldn't be required to. The employer is only required to accommodate the essential functions. The non-essential functions can be um, uh, distributed to other folks. Another thing employers are not required to do is offer paid leave beyond what is ordinarily available as paid leave within the uh, benefits of the, that particular employer. So let's say that Bob is having surgery. Let's say he has a cancer and he's going to need to have some surgery. It's going to be out for a period of time. This particular employer only has, we'll say, two weeks of uh, sick pay benefits. Well, Bob is entitled to those benefits just as any other person would be entitled to this organization, even if the other person is not disabled. But once the two weeks are up, Bob doesn't have any benefits um, to, to, to tap into, and therefore the employer is not required to give him additional benefits uh, that, are that are paid. But the employer is likely to be required to provide additional unpaid leave. We'll talk more about unpaid leave later on in this presentation and also when we get to the Family and Medical Leave Act. Another important thing to keep in mind is that employers cannot usually apply a no-fault attendance policy to a disabled employee. Let me refresh you on what a no-fault attendance policy is. This is a policy that says, listen, we don't really care why you're not at work. We don't really care why you're late. We just know you're not here. And if you're not here at your assigned time this many times during this period of time, you're going to get fired. Um, you might have an awful excuse. You slept in. 
You might have a brilliant excuse. You are rescuing babies from a burning building. We don't care. We just want you here during this time. And if you're not here, you're not getting your work done. That's what a no fault attendance looks like. And generally speaking, they're not unlawful. They're only unlawful when they are applied um, to disabled people and, and or when they are applied to situations that would be Family and Medical Leave Act eligible. So if we were to kind of go back in a time machine to 1989, uh, and an HR attorney would, would likely say, no fault attendance policies are amazing and they're perfect and you need to use them because it makes it very cut and dried who you hire or not who you hire, but who you retain, who you discipline, who you fire. You need to have to worry about discrimination because you're treating everybody the same. Because again, in 1989, you didn't have the American with Disabilities Act, you didn't have the Family and Medical Leave Act. But those two statutes have come down the pike. And as a result, no fault attendance policies are so riddled with exceptions that uh, the exceptions kind of swallow the rule. And so no fault attendance policies are uh, in many organizations kind of meaningless. And they can be very dangerous if you have people applying the no fault attendance policies to situations that qual would qualify as disabilities or for FMLA situations. We'll talk more about this, by the way, when we get to the FMLA chapter, but just want to flag that as very, very dangerous situation. Um, you want to be very careful. And when, whenever you, you are, you see, uh, um, if you're an HR professional or in the legal department and you see that your someone in your organization is firing somebody under a no-fault attendance policy, you want to make sure that before that trigger is pulled, that it has been carefully examined to make sure that we don't have America's Disabilities Act or Family Medical Leave Act issues in the, that particular case. Another thing that employer sentence has to do with reasonable accommodations is alter the work schedule. It may be that the disabled person has to ride the bus to work and the bus doesn't arrive until 8.10. The normal start time for this office is 8 o'clock, but they don't arrive, they can't get off the bus until the bus arrives at 8.10 and they can't get to their particular work spot until about 8.15 or 8.20. Well, you can't count them as late under those circumstances. Um, let's say that this particular person uh, needs to take a certain number of breaks uh, 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 to, to because of the health issue. So maybe they need more breaks than average. That would be another situation. Um, so altering the work schedule is a pretty common approach to um, a, 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 a accommodating a disabled person. Generally, an employer is not required to allow a disabled person to work from home if non-disabled people um, in the workplace do not have this option. So the employer can say, no, we are staying, we, everyone works from the office, you need to work from the office. Now that is the rule, but that doesn't mean that an employer can't agree to allow a disabled person from work, working from home. It can be smart for both parties. Now there are times where it's not a good idea, for example, probably you know a kindergarten teacher can't really work from home right <laughs> uh, so there are definitely jobs that don't lend itself the surgeon can't work from home but there are lots of jobs where the person can work from home and so that can be a way to accommodate a disability that's pretty close to free for the employer you may need to provide you know some uh, electronic resources but there's usually not a lot that you have to do under those circumstances so definitely something worthy of consideration it can also help for disabled employees who um, are experiencing some complications from their disability and perhaps they're not well enough to come into the office or perhaps they're um, you know uh, contagious or perhaps they um, are not able to to you know get get down to the office or whatever, but they can work somewhat from home, and so you can get some value from that. So uh, not required to allow them to work from home, but not at all a bad idea to do that. Sometimes the facilities will need to be mod uh, modified. This is especially important when you're dealing with individuals who are in wheelchairs. Wheelchair users might need uh, bathrooms that are have greater access break rooms, maybe there are stairs that are involved. Um, so things like that need to consider uh, those types of accommodations. The employer's good faith is a really important thing. That's why as you're documenting it, that's one of the things you're trying to show that the employer was willing to consider various approaches. <clears throat> 
here are some things to keep in mind as you decide how you want to handle accommodation. Many times the employee, I mean, employees are human being like the rest of us, and they would like the Cadillac. Um, for example, um, they might need a, 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 a increased size of the material that they're viewing because of a vision problem. So they might like a really, really large monitor. That might be really nice. That would be convenient and positive. Who wouldn't like a big monitor on their computer? But it might also work just to increase the font. Yes, they're going to have to scroll more to see everything. Um, that's not as nice. That's not as pleasant for them. But it may be all that they need. And so it doesn't have to be the employee's preferred option. It just have to, has to reasonably accommodate the problem. So the employee doesn't get a veto. Now, of course, if an accommodation doesn't work, um, only accommodates 80% of the disability, then it's not a good reasonable accommodation. But it doesn't have to be the preferred approach. It doesn't have to do it in the way that exactly the employee wants. Also, employers aren't required to provide things that the employee is going to use outside of work. Hearing aids, for example, uh, wheelchairs, uh, prosthetic devices, canes, things like that. Now, of course, things like uh, computers, um, uh, things that are going to be based in the workplace, those would need to be provided. So we already talked about making facilities accessible, could be broadening openings, could be installing elevators, could be putting in ramps, um, also modifying uh, work schedules and, and considering part-time schedules. Uh, providing qualified readers and interpreters. Readers can apply to uh, for blind individuals, interpreters for deaf individuals. When I'm using these terms, I'm not referring to interpreters of different languages, and I'm not referring to people who are unable to read because of an, of an academic problem. Um, but if they need, if they are unable to read because of a vision problem, because of a learning difference, those would be circumstances where a qualified reader might be appropriate. Usually these types of arrangements aren't going to be, uh, or usually employers aren't required to hire somebody to follow the employee around 24 seven, or at least I guess eight hours a day. Um, so if, if, if we got into a situation where the employee is saying, listen, I need you to hire somebody to follow me around all day and do this and this for me, that is usually considered uh, uh, an undue hardship, even if financially the employer can do it. But if this is something that is only needed occasionally, um, maybe a few hours a week, then, then that would be a situation where very likely it would be considered a reasonable accommodation. So again, an employer doesn't have to create a new job, doesn't have to modify a full-time job to create a part-time position, and it doesn't have to modify the essential functions of the job. That we don't have to make, uh, as an employer, doesn't have to make a new position, doesn't have to make a promotion. Um, it doesn't have to avoid disciplining for misconduct. This oftentimes comes up in drug and alcohol abuse situations where somebody may well have a genuine disability related to drug and alcohol abuse, but that's not stopping the fact that this is having some disciplinary impact. For example, the person is coming to work high or um, drunk or perhaps the person isn't coming to work at all and is having an acceptable level of uh, poor attendance. And so uh, you do not have to excuse a misconduct related to the disability. Again, the, the accommodation just has to be sufficient to meet the needs of the, of the person with a disability. Doesn't have to be the Cadillac version. It can be the sensible Hyundai version. So sometimes what happens is that the individual, because maybe this is a new disability, really is we even with a reasonable accommodation just can't do the job that he or she was already doing prior to the disability. And so now the question is, well, do we need to look around and see if this organization has another position? And the answer is generally yes, that the person ought to be reassigned if possible, if they are qualified to fill that vacant position. Um, that can happen when they are no longer able to fill the essential functions of their own position. Uh, courts have come out different, differently on this. Some courts say, well, you have to put the disabled person into the vacant position, even if the disabled person isn't the best candidate for it. 
because you are reasonably accommodating this, this person. Others have said, well, no, the employer can insist upon putting into that vacant position the best qualified, even though the best qualified person may be someone other than the disabled person. Uh, so if you are in this situation, it's probably a good idea to do a little bit of a deep dive and see if you really don't want, if, if your organization really doesn't want to put the disabled person into the vacant position because you feel like he or she is not the most qualified, you'll want to make sure that that is a sound strategy for you to have in terms of legal compliance standpoint. So now we are done with the reasonable accommodation process and we're going to talk about some special categories of disabilities and I kind of hinted at some of those. One of the ones that can be difficult to maneuver with is intellectual disabilities and so let me just show you a link here. And here is the link for questions and answers of people with intellectual disabilities in the working environment. Several different issues can arise here. For one thing, someone with intellectual di disabilities may not be um, as able to participate fully in that interactive discussion. Um, he or she may not um, know how to describe the condition and what the support associated with the condition might need to be. Um, and so um, there can be challenges with getting some of the medical information and the accommodation information that you need. So here's just some, some links and some other information. Uh, you know, give in instructions at a slower pace. Allow additional time to finish training. Break job task into sequential steps required to perform the task. Use charts, pictures, or colors. Here's an example. As part of his job, a restaurant worker with an intellectual disability refills condiment containers. The manager used color coding so the employee can identify the specific condiment that goes in each container. So he, the, the disabled individual may not be able to um, remember that ketchup goes in this container and salt goes in this container. The uh, employee may not be able to read those terms, but maybe if you put a little red dot on the bottom of the ketchup container, then he can say, okay, ketchup is red, this is red, oh, this is where I'm gonna put the ketchup. And maybe he, you might put um, a white dot underneath the salt container, for example, so that the uh, worker can make, the, make that connection and be successful at the position. So again, you can see those accommodations are essentially free um, and many times they can be very, very inexpensive. So when we talk about intellectual disabilities, what are we talking about? Well, we're talking typically about IQs around 70 or below 70. And usually these individuals have significant limitations in uh, their skill level and many times the disability will have occurred before the age of 18. Now, if a person, for example, has some kind of traumatic brain injury, this might actually arise after the 18th birthday. For example, my brain aneurysm person. Um, that person obviously um, was uh, well over 18 when he had his event. And so um, we want to uh, uh, recognize that this is a usual uh, path, but not necessarily an all every single case path. So we've talked a little bit about um, intellectual limitation disabilities, but probably a more common category that we see in the workforce are going to be psychological impairments. Remember we talked about how a disability is a mental or physical disorder or impairment. And so psychological would certainly fit into that category. Uh, one of the challenges with these is that you can't see it, like you can uh, see a wheelchair or you can see the hearing aid in the ear. Um, it's not something that is as easy to identify. And sometimes people for, um, uh, there's a stigma symptoms associated in some people's minds with a psychiatric or psychological impairments. Sometimes people think that uh, the person with the psychological impairment isn't trying hard enough or perhaps they're faking it or perhaps they have poor character or something along those lines. 
obviously those things aren't true, but they do have um, uh, people with psychiatric issues do confront those issues pretty regularly. And that can cause people with psychological impairments to be reluctant to share the information about it and not necessarily be as, as forthcoming because of the stigma associated with it. Um, another problem with psychological impairments is that sometimes, by no means all the time, but sometimes the person with psychological impairment may um, manifest inappropriate behavior in the workplace. They may be insubordinate, uh, they may have other issues that come up that cause uh, disruption in the workplace. Uh, one issue that can come up is attendance. A person who is experiencing, for example, severe depression may find it very difficult to come to work, and so they, the attendance might fall off. A person with um, a certain uh, psychiatric issues might find it difficult working with other individuals, um, either because they um, have anxiety, for example, or perhaps because um, they um, uh, are, are uncomfortable with other individuals. Perhaps they um, uh, find it difficult to interact socially with individuals. And so uh, there can be problems with teams and things along those lines under those circumstances. So let's consider the attendance issue because this is going to seem surprising, I predict, for many uh, folks. Uh, certainly was surprising to me when, this, when the law was developing this area. The EOC does not hold attendance to be an essential function of a job. Showing up for work is not essential to doing a job, apparently. However, the EOC, while it doesn't hold that attendance is essential, it does say that it's important. And so um, the EOC can say, yes, sometimes you're going to have to waive your attendance policies as a reasonable accommodation. Now, you don't have to keep someone employed who never comes to work, obviously. There gets to be a point where, yeah, you have to have some attendance and some effort, some work effort. But um, you, the, again, as we said before, we cannot apply our no-fault attendance policies to the disabled individual, um, even when uh, perhaps the absences are not because of you know hospitalization or because of surgery, but it may be because that individual who's experiencing, say, uh, major depressive disorder just can't get out of bed that day and yet they're not bleeding they're not recovering from surgery they're not you know it's it's not as um objectively uh necessary uh, uh to an outsider than it might be uh, as some other diagnoses might be now let's talk about addiction this is a I guess part of that psychiatric category and uh, we're really trying going to tr develop divide up addiction into two categories one is prescription and alcohol abuse and the other is illegal drug abuse um, so uh, it's important to kind of keep those separated at times as we're talking about this but let's kind of do some general concepts the first thing is addiction can be a disability. Now, not every person who shows up to work drunk or is discovered having alcohol on him or a person who uh, calls off sick because he had too much drink, not every person in that situation has a disability or is addicted to substances. So uh, you, do, you don't want to start assuming that because a person is hungover that they're an addict because then we get into regarded as disabled remember our third prong we're assuming this person has a disability they don't have they just tied one on last night they don't have a drinking problem they just had a really good time and so it's important not to start thinking that you can diagnose and evaluate people um, when you just don't have enough information so when a person is in recovery for um, uh, whatever the particular type of addiction that they may have um, it, when they are addressing that issue, then they're pretty much going to be treated just like any other disabled person. You know, if I happen to have paralysis, I, need, I have the right to be accommodated. If I am an alcoholic who's not abusing alcohol anymore, I have a right to be accommodated. Um, so, the, so once I'm in recovery and I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, then I am considered disabled for the purposes of the law. Uh, so again, if I'm uh, addicted to, we'll say, to methamphetamines and I enter a drug rehabilitation process 
and um, I am addressing that, then I'm going to be covered. If I am actively abusing cocaine, marijuana, methamphetamines, whatever the substance is that's illegal, um, then I am not going to be treated as if I am a disabled person. In fact, I'm going to be excluded from the definition. Let me just pause here and talk about a related issue, and that is what do we do with marijuana? Because as you know, some jurisdictions have made marijuana a lawful substance under state law. Um, and there's some levels to that. For example, they may have that person, um, they may make marijuana available to people uh, because they have glaucoma or chronic pain or something along those lines. And so it's limited to people who have like a prescription. Uh, medical marijuana is oftentimes what it's called. Then in other jurisdictions, like for example, Colorado, uh, people are allowed to um, use marijuana, assuming they are, uh, I guess, 21, I'm assuming, they can buy it for recreational purposes. So how does that play a role in here? Let's say I be, I be, I'm in, we're in Colorado and I become addicted to uh, marijuana. So I am addicted. Ordinarily, we would say that I have a disability, uh, but it's not an illegal substance in Colorado. Well, that's somewhat inaccurate because it is still an illegal substance under federal law. And so any place I am in the United States, again, we look at state law and we look at federal law. Now, most places in the United States, marijuana is unlawful under state law and also unlawful under federal law. So we really don't need to worry too much about it because it's unlawful under both. That's the law as it exists in Texas. But in Colorado, it's lawful under state law, it's illegal under federal law. And so as a result, employers generally in all states, including Colorado, are able to say that's an illegal substance. A person who's addicted to it is not going to be considered disabled under the Americans with Disabilities Act until they have discontinued the use of that substance. But one can see that a day could come in the future wherein uh, federal law changes or um, uh, there is some ability to opt out of um, the, or this definition is changed under the, uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act so that in places where marijuana usage is legal, then uh, marijuana addiction would be treated like alcohol addiction, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. But currently, illegal substances are treated differently than lawful substances like alcohol and prescription medications. Um, the employer does not need to accommodate drug or alcohol abuse on the job, nor the effects of addiction that may go to essential elements. So for example, if I am hung over at work because I am drunk, was drunk the night before, or I'm drunk at work, or I'm taking a few nips at work, um, then that would be something that the employer does not have to accommodate. Uh, a very common type of accommodation is to offer treatment, uh, making the person's work schedule available so that they can attend um, Alcoholics Anonymous or um, various uh, drug treatment processes, uh, maybe an inpatient program where the person is um, uh, you know, given a, an ability to take some time off from work and they are permitted to return to work when they are um, uh, through that process. Okay, so I said current illegal drug use is not protected under the ADA, but a person who is actively abusing alcohol and prescription medications is considered disabled under the ADA. Um, Um, so that is a difference. That's the big difference. So if you're, if you're abusing a substance that you legally have the right to, to use, then while you're abusing it, you could be considered disabled in the Americans with Disabilities Act. If you're abusing a substance that is illegal for you to use, you only are considered disabled once you stop the abuse. Um, Generally speaking, in, under federal law and under Texas state law, employers have a lot of freedom to uh, test for both drug and alcohol use in the workplace. 
Um, I talk about this in a different uh, module, and so uh, you may want to drill down a little bit more detail into that module to find out the ins and outs of um, drug and alcohol testing. But generally, assuming that the employer follows the law, the employer really has the ability to do pre-employment screening, uh, periodic screening, random screening, and post-accident screening. Screening, it's not screaming, screening, and also reasonable suspicion when there's like a workplace accident or uh, somebody seems to be intoxicated at work, you can do reasonable uh, screening. And there's lots of different types of screening. Uh, common ones are urine. Also, you can have fingernail and hair samples. Those are common. Um, there's probably some places that do breathalyzer type tests. There may even be some that do uh, pin pricks or things like that. Um, individuals who are addicted to drugs but are not currently abusing drugs are protected by the ADA. Uh, alcoholics who are currently abusing alcohol are protected. Alcoholics who are not currently abusing alcohol are protected. So this is the big difference. Even when you're dealing with an alcoholic who's currently abusing alcohol and therefore meets the definition of dis disability, the employer is not required to permit that person to drink at work or have alcohol with them. So bans on intoxication or drinking at work can be enforced um, just as you would against the non-alcoholics. Now you can't have a double standard. You can't allow people to drink at work and say, ah, but Bob, you can't because you're an alcoholic. If you allow Larry, who's not an alcoholic, to drink at work, you can't let Bob drink at work. But if you prohibit everyone from drinking, you can prohibit Bob from drinking. Um, it seems like a pretty no-brainer that you don't want to have alcohol at work, but the ways that this comes up are oftentimes um, it, maybe it's people who are in sales, who are taking people out to lunch or dinner, and it may be that, you know, part of the greasing the wheels process is to, you know, buy a bottle of wine or have some, some cocktails, and under those circumstances, um, you need to be consistent with how you apply those rules. So let's talk about the confession. Um, Many times the way that the employer becomes aware that there is an, a substance abuse or alcohol abuse situation is when the employer is addressing uh, poor job performance. Perhaps it is um, missed deadlines, uh, personality difficulties in work, showing up to work late, not showing up to work at all. Um, things like that, I mean, there can be a million different reasons that cause those problems. And so it doesn't necessarily follow that the person who's experiencing those things is doing it because they are having an addiction problem. So the employer is trying to address it either through progressive discipline or perhaps through termination. And as that gets close to the, the, the end, the employee comes forward and says, ah, but the reason why I've had these problems is I'm an alcoholic or I have been abusing drugs, but I'm clean and sober today, right? And so what do you do under those circumstances as, as the employer? It certainly raises some challenges because now you know about uh, the disability and you may well, especially with alcohol, have the obligation to reasonably accommodate it. You probably don't have to reasonably accommodate the performance problems that you saw previously. But now that you know about it, do you have to start with a clean slate probably not a clean slate. Um, and really, if it literally is happening during the termination interview, um, I, my recommendation in most cases would be to go forward with the termination interview and then to seek some legal advice to see, um, is this appropriate? Because you can always call the person the next day and say, huh, we're taking you back, you know, right? Um, but if you stop the, the termination interview at that particular moment, then it's hard to say, okay, well, we thought about it, but we still want to go ahead and fire you. So um, in many cases, it, it could be appropriate to terminate, but then still look at it more closely. Alternatively, you could say, wait a second, this is new information. We weren't aware of this. Why don't you head on home? we'll give you a call tomorrow and talk about where we are on this. Um, so it's definitely something worthy of consideration, worthy of reflection. Um, but many times the issue doesn't come up at the dismissal interview, but happens 
when you're pretty far down the progressive disciplinary process. For example, maybe you've, you've had several meetings about this and there's been no mention about substance abuse problems and now you're you know, maybe in the next to last step and now they're saying it. And now they want kind of a clean slate to address these particular issues. Maybe they want to go to inpatient treatment or something along those lines. Um, again, that's something that uh, certainly re re should require a lot of reflection to see kind of what the next step ought to be. It's not obvious what to do under those circumstances. As I said before, accommodations could well be time off for treatment. That's a very common accommodation. So let's consider this scenario. So um, a company discovers that one of its employees, Mary, is an alcoholic. Her manager realizes that Mary's alcoholism must be the reason for absenteeism. So to help Mary overcome her alcoholism, the employer uh, provides her with counseling and asks her to make, you know, a choice between treatment and discipline. Um, the, the company offers her some outplacement treatment. Mary tries it, but it doesn't work out for her. So then the, the employer suggests some inpatient treatment. Mary is not willing to participate in that. So the company fires Mary. Under these circumstances, the company is not likely to be found to be liable under the ADA because it offered Mary several reasonable accommodations and Mary refused to do them. Um, but if you have an employer who's not willing to do all of these steps and wants to cut Mary loose earlier, that's when it becomes a little dicey. And certainly it's ultimately the employer's decision how much legal risk to take in these cases. But the employer needs to ha understand and be able to quantify what that risk is um, before making that decision. We've already gone through these, so I'm not going to spend more time on this slide. So now we're ready to talk about remedies. Um, what can a successful plaintiff get if um, he is successful in his disability discrimination lawsuit? Well, the first thing you can get is back pay. In most of these cases, the situation arises wherein he's been dismissed or perhaps not hired originally uh, because he isn't able to be successful in his job. Um, so he's entitled to the back pay, the pay that he would have earned if he had been maintained in his position. Now, of course, if he's been able to find alternative work, then you would take whatever he's earned in his alternative employment. That would be his mitigation, and you would subtract that from the amount of back pay uh, that uh, he otherwise would have been entitled to. Then, of course, you can have front pay, pay that he would earn in the future if he had, were still employed. Um, or alternatively, the employee can be reinstated to the workplace. Um, sometimes one approach is appropriate, sometimes the other approach is appropriate. Um, uh, many times uh, it's not unusual for kind of the relationship to be so sour between the employer and the employee that really reinstatement would be just miserable and awful for everybody. And so front pay may be the better choice in those cases. But there could be other times wherein reinstatement is a realistic opportunity. The successful plaintiff would be entitled to any attorney's fees that he or she has incurred, as well as any court costs. That would be the filing costs for lawsuit, costs of depositions, things along those lines. If intentional discrimination is proved, and so this is not, um, uh, situations wherein, gosh, the, the jury concluded that the reasonable accommodation should have been a, a scoonch more generous, um, but there really is is um, just a, a refusal to really comply with the law. And under those circumstances, then compensatory damages and punitive damages may be available to the plaintiff. Again, um, not, not an automatic situation. I'm not going to spend a lot of time with this case. This is a pretty fact intensive case. I will tell you that when you read this, um, let me give you a little bit of personal background. Um, my grandfather was most likely born deaf. He was born in 1913 in a small Texas town. And um, not, uh, no one's really sure exactly when he lost his, his hearing, but he certainly never had meaningful hearing, um, even as a baby. And um, so he actually went to the Texas School for the Deaf and um, uh, learned uh, primarily to lip read and finger spell. Um, and he could speak uh, in a way that was understandable for the most part to people who knew him well. Uh, but he wasn't able, he never learned traditional sign language and he is not unusual in that. 
and so it's not unusual for deaf individuals to um, have a variety, there's a, a variety of different ways that deaf individuals communicate with hearing individuals. And sometimes it's through lip reading, sometimes it's through a variety of um, uh, sign language uh, methods, um, written notes, uh, lots of different approaches. And so um, in, in my life as the granddaughter of a deaf individual, um, I had those experiences. And I also, as an attorney who had clients with hearing impaired employees, I saw lots of different ways that this played out. Um, the employer might hire uh, a, an American Sign Language interpreter. The American Sign Language interpreter shows up and what she or he is doing is not understandable to the employee. Um, and so you have to bring in maybe a family member of the employee and the particular version of sign language that they've developed almost their own um, dialect of, of sign language is what is used to communicate effectively. So it can be a difficult process to get the right person in the room to help make that communication happen. The reason that I'm sharing this is I want to kind of show the complexity of these issues. And so when I read this case, this Walmart case, um, I'm not defending Walmart, uh, but, but I, I can sympathize because I've seen some cases similar to this one and how it can be a very, very complicated scenario. And so I, I wouldn't beat up Walmart quite as much as this opinion says. It, it's a more challenging and nuanced situation. But uh, for whatever it's worth, the, the court did beat up on Walmart pretty badly. It held that the managers uh, who were uh, supposed to be managing Mr. Ampar Amaro, who was a hard of hearing, um, really didn't give him the resources that he needed. And so the court held that managers who possess hiring and firing authority may make the employer liable for punitive damages when the managers engage in reckless indifference to the intentional discrimination of disabled individuals. Um, and again, uh, this is kind of presented as, as a warning story because I said before how you really have to show almost um, intentional discrimination to get compensatory damages and punitive damages. But I can almost promise you that Walmart didn't think that it was engaging in reckless indifference to the intentional discrimination of disabled individuals. So um, you say potato, I say potato kind of thing. There's, there's a, a, a range of interpretations of these facts. And so it's, it, don't assume, I guess in other words, that you aren't going to necessarily experience exposure for punitive damages. Sometimes you will, even when you think you've done a pretty darn good job in this area. Okay, so now we're going to talk about special topics. Hiring, harassment, contingent workers, retaliation, workers' compensation, genetics, and leave issues. Let's get started. Okay, we talked a lot about hiring when we were um, in an earlier segment, so I'm not going to uh, repeat a lot of that stuff. I'm just going to remind you of some of the things that we talked about. The ADA does limit the questions that an employer can ask before an employment offer is made. You can't ask things like, do you have disabilities, or what are your disabilities, or tell me more about your disabilities. Um, there are specific guidelines, and those are very helpful to have available to you. Uh, again, you don't always know when your next candidate for your interview is going to be disabled, so you have to uh, kind of come to each interview prepared to handle those situations. Um, you can only ask disabil disability related questions um, after you've issued a conditional job offer. And the way, it, the way it can, well, I have a slide here for a second, conditional job offer, so I won't define that. So you can't start saying, well, now I see you're in a wheelchair. Um, how are we going to manage that in our particular work environment? You can't go there until you've offered the job to the individual. So um, there's a kind of a tricky dance here that you have to get the order of things correct. Now you may wonder, well, what about drug tests? Uh, we want to do drug tests. Yet yeah, those are not considered one of these tests, one of these examinations. They're not a medical examination. So you can test for drug and alcohol um, usage, um, even though it's possible that some of the people you're testing for may have um, an addiction uh, to one or the other substance. 
Um, one of the things you have to be aware about though when you're doing drug tests is that the person that you are um, testing may have a disability that will cause the test to become positive. Imagine for a second that you have a, uh, a, a candidate who is has cancer and as a result of the cancer is experiencing a lot of pain. So he or she has been uh, uh, been prescribed appropriate doses of an opio opioid medication to help with the pain. Obviously that person is going to come back with a positive drug screen. So the way that should work out in the drug screening process is that when the drug test comes positive, then somebody from the drug testing organization, someone outside of the employer, is going to call the employee and say, hey Bob, you tested positive. Tell us what you know your various prescriptions are, and we'll confirm those and go from there. So then Bob shares the information about his, you know, codeine or whatever uh, prescription. The um, employ the uh, the medical officer is able to confirm the authenticity of that prescription and is able to confirm that that would be the basis of the positive drug screen results and therefore the employer would hear back that this person uh, tested negative. The employer will never hear about that uh, part of that uh, process and so it's important that you uh, use a very rigorous systematic um, well-documented uh, method to have drug testing so that you don't inadvertently hear about um, uh, uh, the, the prescription medications that your disabled workers may be using. So when an employer, oh, so let's talk about the tie situation. So you have two workers, Bob and Larry. Uh, they're equally qualified for the job. You just don't know which one to go with, but Bob has a disability that's going to cost your, your, off, your company but money. Larry doesn't. It seems like a pretty obvious choice to hire Larry because after all, they're equally qualified. Well, the law says you can't prefer Larry for that reason. Um, if the only reason you're hiring Larry over Bob is because you're going to save some money that's not legally permitted. Um, now, if you can point to something about Larry that makes Larry just a scrunch better than Bob, you're okay. You're okay hiring the best qualified. But it can't, the, the best qualified can't include as part of that best qualification the fact that you're saving some money. So let's consider this scenario. Bob and Mary are two applicants for a job. Bob is disabled, he needs a wheelchair, Mary is able-bodied. Both are equally qualified for the job. The employer picks Mary over Bob solely because if it had hired Bob, it's gonna need to modify the works, workspace, um, move around some things, that's gonna cost some money. It's gonna be somewhat inconvenient for some folks for a while. Under these circumstances, the employer would be liable because it is unlawful to discriminate against Bob, the disabled employee, just to avoid um, having to fulfill a reasonable accommodation. So here are some things that we can do. Employers may ask applicants whether they can perform the essential function of the job with or without reasonable accommodations. This is a this is okay to ask before that conditional job offer. So Bob comes in, he's in a wheelchair. You explain the essential functions of the job. Let's say one of the essential functions is uh, emptying the trash cans in the in the office. So you need to say can you empty the trash your one of the central functions of your job is to empty the trash cans in the office can you do so with or without reasonable accommodations you can also ask him how he would do it well he might say um i would roll up in my wheelchair i would pick up the trash can i would put the trash can on my lap and um maybe have a some kind of a device a band that i would put around my waste that would hold the trash can securely on my, um, you know, on my lap and then I would wheel to wherever the larger trash can receptacle is and I would put it into the larger trash can receptacle. Um, if the trash can receptacle was too tall for me, I would use the ramp that y'all have installed at this location so that I would uh, wheel myself up the ramp, get to the top of the ramp, and then put the trash down the, the thing. So that would be an example of how it might be accomplished. These are lawful questions that can be asked before the conditional 
a job offer. Um, you can only ask disability related questions after the conditional job offer. So you can't ask um, about the reason why Bob is in the wheelchair. And you cannot require medical examinations until after the conditional job offer. So let's talk about what a conditional job offer is. It's actually just what you think it is. Um, it's a job offer that is conditioned. And it's conditioned, in this case, on the employer's reasonable accommodation of the applicant's disability. You may not be certain you can accommodate it. So you offer the job, you say, listen, we're offering this job with the assumption we'll be able to figure out how to accommodate your situation. Maybe we won't be able to. So we're going to offer you the conditional job, and then we're going to try to figure it out. Um, now, one of the secrets to this is that you have to do the conditional job offer route with everyone. You can't just do it for disabled individuals. And so um, you have to you know, be aware that when you do, um, uh, you know, let's say, for example, the conditional job offer, you're requiring the disabled person to have a, doc a doctor's note saying that he or she can do the job safely. Well, you have to then require that same thing for all workers who are being hired, not just the disabled workers. So this is an important part of the process. You have the, the interview process, then you decide, yes, we're offering the job to Bob, but we're giving him a conditional job offer. That's when you can have the medical examination. And then assuming the medical examination is successfully passed by Bob, that's when the employment, when the job offer moves from conditional job offer to permanent job, not permanent job offer, but, you know, really job offer that's, that's lasting, that's enduring. And so if you're going to require the medical examination of the disabled person, you have to do it for all candidates for that particular job. Okay, let's talk about disability harassment. Fortunately, this is not usually a big area. Um, most people don't want to harass people who are disabled. It doesn't seem like a very nice thing to do. There have been some occasions of it, and we see this probably in the AIDS or HIV area. Now let's imagine that you have a worker who is HIV positive or who has AIDS. If the person is being mistreated because of his HIV or AIDS status, then that is disability discrimination is probably covered. But if the person is being harassed because of his or her um, uh, same-sex attraction, um, because he or she is a gay or lesbian or someone in the LGBT community, then that is not a covered situation. Uh, many employers choose to protect people under those circumstances, and it's certainly lawful for employers to do so, but it's not a statutorily required thing. So you have to, when you're navigating that area, figure out well, what is the harassment about? Is it really about the disability or is it about something else? So workplace harassment is prohibited when it creates a hostile work environment against disabled workers. And again, it wouldn't have to be all disabled workers. It could be a particular disabled worker. Imagine for a, sec for a, for a second that there is a hearing impaired disabled worker. And as a result of the hearing impairment, she speaks uh, with a, a different accent, with a different way of speaking that may be somewhat difficult to understand. And let's say people in the workforce uh, mock her style of speech, imitate it um, in a demeaning way. Um, but in that work department, there's somebody in a wheelchair. Nobody says anything mean to the person in the wheelchair. Well, in those situations, the person who is deaf could be subject to workplace harassment, even though other people in the workplace who are disabled are not being mistreated. And again, the requirements for establishing a hostile work environment are the same that we saw with um, sex harassment, race harassment, sex, uh, uh, national origin harassment, religious harassment, all those other categories. Uh, but we, so we would use the Title VII model. And again, the harassment must be severe or per pervasive. Um, a single instance where somebody told a joke that kind of fell flat or uh, was unkind to somebody with disability is not going to uh, mean that it, there is an example of harassment. Now certainly employers can and perhaps should uh, have a zero tolerance policy because an employer is perfectly free to discipline people even though the behavior does not reach the level of disability harassment. Uh, so just because it doesn't meet the legal standard doesn't mean the employer can't address that and perhaps should address that. 
Let's talk about workers' compensation. This is a very interesting topic. We'll talk more about this in other modules. Um, if you have always lived in Texas, and especially if you're not very old, um, you have been living in a workers' compensation schema that is very unusual. In fact, Texas is really the only state that does workers' compensation the way that we do workers' compensation. Oklahoma has something kind of similar too, but other than Texas and Oklahoma, the other 49 states have some variation between them, but they're much more similar than they're different, than, than uh, they're much more similar to each other than they're similar to Texas. So I'm going to first of all explain how the other 40 states do it as a general idea. Um, because it's important to know that for two reasons. Number one, you may choose to work as an HR professional or a legal professional in one of those other states. So you need to know how that system works. Number two, the system I'm about to describe that applies in the other 48 states does sometimes apply in Texas. So you need to know about this even in Texas. So let's first of all talk about what workers' compensation is. It's a, it's a statutory scheme, I don't mean scheme in a bad way, but a statutory system to provide no fault insurance. So you can see here, no fault, let me just do a little arrow here. No fault, so this term here relates to this definition. No fault insurance for lost wages and medical expenses resulting from work-related injuries. It's a very different idea than the ADA. And the, of course, the ADA has only been around since 1990. Workers' compensation statutes have been around forever. I mean, at least since the early 1900s, maybe about then, I would say. Most workers' compensation injuries are not going to be disabilities. Um, so it doesn't necessarily follow that just because um, a person is injured at work that the Americans Disabilities Act is going to apply to that particular person. So when we use the term no fault, what do we mean? Let's go down here. Liability for injury imposed regardless of fault. So let's think for a second. I'm at work. Um, let's say I'm at work in Wisconsin. So that we, 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 we don't have the Texas system. I am working on an assembly line and my job is to uh, screw a widget you know what, I get distracted for a second. I mean, I've been doing this for seven hours. It's not the most exciting thing. And I get distracted for a second. I'm not paying attention. And you know what happens? My hand gets caught in the conveyor belt and I have a bad injury. Um, I, you know, seek medical assistance and, and get the, the issue resolved. Um, when it's being investigated, they conclude that I messed up. I was not, for, the, for about 30 seconds or a minute, was not doing what I was supposed to do. Let's say there was a camera that was able to capture the whole thing. I am never supposed to put my hands on the conveyor belt. But you know what? I did it. I did it for 30 seconds. I'm not a terrible, awful, evil person. I was careless. Guess what? People are careless sometimes. Uh, is that important to whether I'm going to get benefits or not? In Wisconsin, not at all. Um, I am going to be entitled to my lost wages and to my medical expenses, even though I messed up, even though I acted negligently. Um, so I, I, it's, this isn't a situation in which um, I'm going to have to prove that I wasn't at fault. Uh, the, the, the recognition in workers' comp statute is that sometimes the employer messes up, sometimes the employee messes up, Sometimes somebody else messes up. Somebody no, sometimes nobody messes up. It just happens. And the worst comp statute says, we're not going to worry about that. We're not going to focus on who's at fault. We're just going to focus on getting the worker better, getting his bills or her bills paid, and not worry about who's at fault and who's not at fault. Because that takes a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of effort to figure that out. Another thing about workers' compensation statutes is that the benefits that the worker's going to get are relatively small. They're not complete wage replacement, and many times there's limitations to the medical expenses that the employee, employee can, can um, experience. And so um, it, it's not uh, a huge perk, I guess you could say. It, it's, it, it's definitely not like, Winning the lottery. A workers' compensation claim is not like winning the lottery. 
So the standard is not negligence. It's not the failure to meet the appropriate standard of care for avoiding unreasonable risk of harm to others. I, the worker, doesn't, don't need to prove that the employer was negligent. The employer doesn't have any reason to want to prove that I, the employee, was negligent because, again, it's a no-fault system. Um, that is how it works um, in the 49 states. That's how it works in Texas if the particular employer is what we call a subscriber. Now, not magazine subscription, but someone who has chosen to subscribe to the workers' compensation uh, scheme in Texas. Employers in Texas have the option to opt out. Let me just actually let, let's wait. We'll, we'll say the, the text specific stuff for a second. Um, the issue is whether the injury arose out of or in the course of employment. Obviously, if I'm working on the conveyor belt that worked that was within the course and scope of employment, but when I am at home and I cut myself with a can opener, I'm not at work. So therefore. I'm not going to be able to successfully follow a workers' comp claim. When I'm riding the bus home from work, and let's say the bus driver runs into another car and I'm injured, guess what? I'm not at work. So therefore, I'm not going to be able to follow a workers' compensation claim. Um, you know, so it has to be arising out of or in the course of employment. So let's see this scenario. Bob works as a machine operator at Dancing Tiger Industries, which is a workers' compensation subscriber. We'll, know that we'll see why this is important in a second. One day, while getting a machine started, Bob slips and falls from the ladder and breaks his elbow. Bob will be covered under workers' compensation if he is able to prove his injuries arose out of or in the course of his employment. Sounds like he will be able to, so this is a pretty clear liability. That he will be able to collect payment even if he was being careless. He was supposed to be wearing that safety harness when he did this. He was supposed to be wearing non-skid shoes. He was supposed to be taking one step at a time very slowly. Whatever the thing is, he didn't do it. He, must, he messed up, perhaps, but still he's going to be entitled to workers' compensation benefits. So let's talk about going bare. Um, employers in Texas can go bare, meaning they can opt out of the statutory workers' compensation system. So if an employer chooses to go bare, the employee isn't going to file claims under the workers' compensation statute. The employee, if the employer has gone bare, the employee is going to have to sue the employer for whatever the claims are. And then it's going to become very relevant whether there was negligence or not and who was negligent. So this means that, let's say that I work in a Texas operation and again, I was negligent. I wasn't following the procedures, and as a result of my failure to follow the procedures, I'm injured. Um, my employer is not a subscriber. My employer has gone bare. I can't use the workers' compensation scheme in Texas, so I'm going to have to file a lawsuit against my employer. My problem is going to be I was negligent, and so I'm not going to be successful, so I'm not going to be entitled to lost wages or medical expenses under that system. But let's imagine that I wasn't negligent. Let's say that the employer was negligent, that the employer had, you, had maintained this equipment that I was using improperly. And because of the poor maintenance, I was injured. Well, now I can sue based upon my employer's negligence. And this is the good news for the employee. The small benefits that I might be eligible to under workers' compensation statute, I don't have those limitations anymore. I can sue for a lot more goodies. So for employers who choose to go bare, they are potentially exposing themselves to significantly greater risk. Um, the employer makes a choice, the employee doesn't. Now in theory, the, or the well actually this isn't in theory, it's in practice, the employer is required to publish um, or post a, a sign saying whether they have chosen to go bare or not. And the idea here is, well, that an employee could say, wait a second, I don't want to go to work for an employer that's gone bare. I want one that's a subscriber to the workers' compensation system uh, because I'm concerned that if I have an accident, I want to make sure I have all the remedies that I'm entitled to under the statute. I think realistically, that's not something that very many employers employees choose to do. I don't know what percentage of employers have chosen to go bare, but it's my sense it's a pretty high percentage in Texas. So it's definitely something to look into. 
um, when you're seeking employment, perhaps. And certainly if you work as um, an HR manager or in the legal department, but you'll want to be aware of how that impacts uh, worker safety programs and how you handle uh, workers, worker injuries. Okay, let's consider the topic of contingent workers. Um, sometimes when em employers choose to, especially when they want to control salary costs or they're not sure if this is going to be a permanent need, um, they may choose to hire people through some kind of uh, staffing operation. Well, of course, both the staffing operation and the user of that employee's services will need to comply with Title VII and all the other employment laws, including the Americans with Disabilities Act. And so reasonable accommodations can be required into those circumstances as well. But it's not just for permanent workers. Uh, retaliation is prohibited under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Here's some language to keep in mind. The ADA prohibits discrimination against anyone who made a charge, testified, assisted, or participated in any hearing in an investigation, proceeding, or hearing. Interference, coercion, and intimidation are similarly forbidden. So you should obviously not have retaliation against ADAs. And you can see this is the way that a non-disabled person can potentially have a claim under ADA. Genetic testing. We're going to talk in other places about gyna, but let me just kind of talk just very briefly about it. So what is genetic testing? This is the analysis of genetic material, chromosomes, genes, gene products, to determine whether a mutation is present that might uh, cause a certain illness or condition or already has caused it. The statute that we look to here is GINA, Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. And as you can see, it has an abbreviation. This is the statute that we've used. It's a re relatively recent statute. There hasn't been much litigation at all in this area. It applies when we have at least 15 employees. So it's the same number we see with Title VII and ADA. Um, so under GINA, employers cannot request information from an employee or applicant to get genetic information. And also the employer cannot consider someone's genetic information in taking the employment action. Um, GINA also prohibits uh, higher premiums for people who have a some kind of genetic anomaly. So if I happen to um, have, say, the gene that makes it more likely that I will develop breast cancer, uh, the uh, employer can't charge me a higher insurance premium as a result of that. So far, we haven't seen a lot of activity in this area, but probably there will at some point be uh, more significant uh, concerns about employer use of this type of information. Okay, so let's talk very briefly about the Family Medical Leave Act and the Americans with Disabilities Act and how that impacts how they uh, uh, work together. The first thing to keep in mind is that employers require to comply with both statutes. And uh, how you comply with the FMLA is pretty darn straightforward. It's difficult to comply with. Uh, many employers are not in full compliance with this act. But what you have to do you pretty much know. I mean, if you know the statute, you know if you're doing it or not. Um, the Americans with Disabilities Act is much more loosey-goosey. I mean, what is a reasonable accommodation and when does it cross the line into being coming undue hardship? I mean, there aren't things like, oh gosh, you never have to give more than X number of weeks under the Americans with Disabilities Act. There's no cutoff like that. And so you, you're always in the gray area there. So you're not in the gray with FMLA, but you can be with the ADA. So what does the FMLA require? Well, it provides up to 12 weeks of leave per year for a covered condition. And by the way, many conditions that are not disabilities would be covered under the FMLA. I would say that if it is a disability under the, under the ADA, it's very likely to be an FMLA covered condition. Um, the Americans with Disabilities Act doesn't provide a certain timeline. It doesn't say 12 weeks or 14 weeks or 26 weeks. Um, it appears, though, based upon the case law, that, that it can be more, probably significantly more than 12 weeks. Um, unless it is an undue hardship, a leave for an extended period of time, again, beyond the 12 weeks, may be considered to be a reasonable accommodation to the ADA. Um, 
So let's consider this scenario. Mary, who works as a staff manager at Melissa Inn, has a minor blood clot in her brain and thus goes on an extended 14 weeks of leave for her surgery. However, she has not been able to completely recover within 14 weeks and asks her employer for an additional two weeks leave to recuperate. Melissa, inform, Melissa Inn informs her that her position might no longer be available when she returns for an extended leave and Mary agrees. Under the ADA, Melissa Inn should find a vacant position for Mary at a equivalent position or if not available at a lower position when she returns. So we can see we're beyond the 12 weeks of FMLA. If instead we were looking at say 10 weeks here and 12 weeks here when she returns, then we'd have to follow the very specific and well-defined rules about reinstatement under FMLA, but we just don't have those under the ADA, so it is definitely a more loosey-goosey structure. Uh, but you always have to comply with the FMLA and with the ADA. So if you know if you're within the 12 weeks, you have to do at least this, and you also may need to do even more here. So it can be a challenging uh, journey. In Texas, we do not have a state law equivalent of FMLA. I mean, there are several states, though, that do. The ones that immediately come to mind are Wisconsin and Connecticut. And those, you have to make sure that the ins and outs of the state law also are being complied with. So you actually have in those states three different statutes. The state equivalent of the Family Medical Leave Act, the Federal Family and Medical Leave Act, and the Americans with Disabilities Act. And so it can be a challenging thing to get all coverage in all those areas. So let's consider who is covered by the Family and Medical Leave Act. And again, we're going to drill down into this quite a bit more in a later presentation, but uh, let's get started at least here. So the coverage is, is uh, covers fewer employee, employers. You need to have at least 50 employees to be covered by the Family and Medical Leave Act. And the reality is that even some very large employers, like a Walmart, will find that some of its workforce is not covered by the Family and Medical Leave Act. If, let's say, it's a remote area where you only have, say, 20 workers um, in, a, uh, in a fairly deserted area, then even though, obviously, Walmart's a very large employer generally, in that small area, the Family Medical Leave Act may not apply. So it can be a rather subtle and complicated analysis, but at the end of the day, the numbers just add up or they don't add up. So it's a pretty cut and dried situation. This type of individual analysis unit by unit does not apply to the Family Medical Leave Act. Under the FMLA, an employee is entitled to return to a position when taking the leave, and the returning to ret is entitled to return to the position when we're taking the leave, and the returning position should be the same or the equivalent position. So, if the uh, employee is able to return at 12 weeks or earlier, basically the employer should put that employee back in exactly the same position. Now, while the employee is out, obviously the employer can. Uh, hire somebody or have a temp or have another worker fill in that job responsibility for the time. But a uh, best practice would be to, once the employee returns, to put the employee back into that same position. Now, there is a little bit of flexibility. So it's possible, you know, like let's say, um, well, let's give the example of a school teacher. I'm a kindergarten teacher and I teach, I teach in room 107. Um, and um, it might be that I am reinstated into 106. I'm still a kindergarten teacher, but I'm teaching, you know, different kids, the kids that happen to have been assigned to the other room. I would say that that would probably be an equivalent position. It might even be an equivalent position if I'm put into the first grade classroom. But it definitely would not be an equivalent position if I were given an office job, maybe being a counselor or an assistant principal. It definitely wouldn't be an equivalent position if I were made to be a sixth grade teacher. Um, so you can see that it, the best practice is probably to put the person in exactly the same seat that he or she was in before. But there could be a little bit of, of, of uh, malleability there. Okay, so let's go and talk about the scenario here. Mary, who's a waitress at the pancake house is seven months pregnant. She is one of 57 employees, so we're over the 50, so we, Family Medical Leave Act is going to apply. Um, 
She's one of 57 employees of the restaurant and has worked there for a full-time basis for three for the past three years. We'll see it's important that she worked a certain number of hours over the last year, so this is a, a good fact to note. Recently, her doctor informed her that she was, uh, is having a high risk pregnancy and therefore that she needs bed rest. Mary is unable to work for the next few months. She asks her employer for time off from work. Mary's entitled to 12 weeks of unpaid job protected leave under FMLA. She's probably not going to be entitled to protection under the ADA because it's pregnancy related and it's going to resolve itself once she gives birth. Now, if she has an underlying condition, let's say she has diabetes, for example, then um, her diabetes is impacting her pregnancy. And so therefore, the ADA could apply under those circumstances, not so much because of the pregnancy, but because of the diabetes. Um, so um, that's how that plays out. Now, sometimes people with the family medic leave get confused by the term unpaid leave. Uh, this is one of the biggest mistakes people make in this area. So I do want to flag this here. The FMLA does provide only unpaid leave in the amount of 12 weeks. But for most workers, that's not going to be completely unpaid because whatever benefits the employer offers, those will come in for the first few weeks. So let's imagine that Mary has is entitled to seven days of uh, vacation time and she's entitled to four days of sick leave. So she's entitled to 11 days total of, of paid leave. Um, she's used up some of it, but this is what's left over. Well, her first 11 days of her leave will be paid. And then she's entitled to, um, uh, I guess what that would be nine days, nine, nine weeks and four days of additional leave. And the remaining leave will be unpaid. So you can see she's only entitled to the 12 weeks, but some of that may be paid because of other benefits the employer offers and some of it may be unpaid. Now, of course, employers are not required to provide any paid leave. So it might be that Mary, or maybe Mary's used up all of her paid leave already because she was on vacation or something else. And so then all of her leave would be unpaid. But I always like to provide a little clarification of that because that's an area of a lot of confusion out there. Okay, so this is an interesting issue. This was very, very controversial in the uh, 1990s. Of course, it's been resolved by the U.S. Supreme Court. Imagine that we have a plaintiff who has applied for Social Security Disability Benefits. For those of you that don't know, it's very difficult to qualify for Social Security Disability Benefits. You really have to be majorly limited in what you can do in terms of employment. Well, in this case, this particular person did apply and as a result of the process made certain statements, sworn statements saying that she was not able to work because of her disability. Well, at, at she then as uh, she's advancing her social security disability claim, she's also suing her employer, saying the employer failed to reasonably accommodate her. And so she's basically saying, I could have worked if the employer had done what the employer should have done and is required to do under the Americans with Disabilities Act. But the employer said, aha, employee, you have given inconsistent statements. You swore to the, in the social security disability application, you couldn't work, but now you're saying in the um, ADA lawsuit, you sure could have if we had just fulfilled our obligation. Well, which one is it? When were you lying, essentially, is what the employer is saying. Well, what uh, the uh, employees came back and said is, listen, the um, disability uh, dis uh, Social Security disability application doesn't talk about reasonable accommodation. And in fact, the standard that was developed for Social Security disability uh, was well before the Americans with Disabilities Act developed. So there was no need at the time that Social Security disability uh, program began to even consider reasonable accommodation. And so what she's saying is, listen, I can be both. I can be eligible for Social Security Disability Benefits at the same time that I can successfully advance an American Disabilities Act failure to reasonably accommodate claim. So, and the court agreed. The court said, yes, it is theoretically possible to be advancing a Social Security Disability Claim and still successfully advance an ADA claim. Having said that, it's not the easiest thing in the world to do. You have to be able to explain how you can reconcile those two things. The Supreme Court held that under certain circumstances, a disabled person might receive both Social Security benefits 
Social Security disability benefits and a reasonable accommodation to the ADA from the, from the employer. The court held that concurrent Social Security disability claims and ADA claims can occur, but here's where we have the importance exception. The plaintiff must provide a sufficient explanation for the apparent contradiction, because it is an apparent contradiction. When the Social Security Administration determines whether an individual is disabled for Social Security disability benefits, it does not take into account the possibility of reasonable accommodation. So this is the linchpin. This is why the two can be reconciled with each other. You don't need to know the name of this case, but this is a, a concept that sometimes throws people and they hear about the Social Security disability claim, they say, oh, well, we don't have to do any more ADA stuff. Not at all true. You still do need to go down that path. So now we've completed all of the topics in our second lecture. We're just going to have some loose ends to tie up, some things to remind. One thing to keep in mind is don't make assumptions. Don't assume you know what this person needs or what is possible to do or impossible to do or what, how this situation should be resolved. You need to recognize in a way your own limitations. What you know may not be that much. Um, you haven't lived this journey the way this disabled person has and so you need to approach it with a fair amount of uh, humility I guess you could say and openness to solving the problem. You'll want to make sure that you're listening to the employee carefully, hearing what he or she has to say, asking questions, and brainstorming with that employee to get the best outcome. You'll want to especially focus on training your interviewers to know what they can and cannot say, what they can and cannot ask during the application process. Uh, uh, role play with them so they know what that's like and then have some instructions for them when they encounter a situation that they've never seen before. Maybe they're a little thrown. Someone comes up, they're in a wheelchair, they have no idea how this person would be able to do the job in a wheelchair. And the, the advice is don't worry about the wheelchair. We'll deal with the wheelchair on a separate time. Let's just talk about the person and ask the same questions we would have asked if this was someone who wasn't in a wheelchair. And then let's get together and talk about how the wheelchair situation might impact the, the way that we approach the second round of interviews. Another thing is when you're dealing with training your um, line managers to know, well, what is a re request for reasonable accommodation? What is that going to sound like? And what, do, what does that manager need to do? And, and how quickly does he or she need to act to address that? Um, what you don't want to have is, is an employee who's making a request for reasonable accommodation and a manager who doesn't recognize that request. You may not want that manager to be super involved, at least in the initial stages of resolving it. You may want to have somebody, for example, from HR be that point person, although likely the manager is going to have to have some role. But that manager may be the person who alerts HR about the need for the issue. Well, I hope that this presentation has been helpful. It's been a pleasure making the presentation. If you have questions or concerns or you have uh, things that you would like to talk with me about in more detail, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, my email is cgroover at colin.edu or better yet, come by my office hours or call me during my office hours so we can talk through these issues in more detail. They certainly can be interesting ones um, and certainly can be challenging ones to resolve. So I look forward to hearing from you. Again, thanks for your attention and I hope you have a wonderful day.